Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. My name is Jackie Lovely, and I'm the Parliamentary Secretary to the Associate Minister of Status of Women. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that Calgary is on Treaty 7 territory, home to the Blackfoot Confederacy of the Siksika, Kane, Bikani, as well as the Tsutsina, and Stony Nakoda nations of Bear Paw, Chikini, and Wesley. This area is also deeply important to the people of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. We're joined today by Minister of Transportation, Rajan Sani, Minister of Community and Social Services, Jason Luan, Associate Minister of Status of Women, Whitney Isaac, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Community and Social Services for Civil Society, Jeremy Nixon, and the Chair of the Premier's Council, uh, Charities and Civil Society, Dr. Joel Christie. Alberta's government has been focused on supporting this province's economic recovery and building a strong Alberta. One of the most important elements of Alberta's recovery plan is strategic investments to help women participate fully in the economy. Today, I'm proud that the new recommendations, based on the insights of nonprofits, women, and Indigenous communities, will help guide this work. I'll now hand it over to the Associate Minister Isaac to provide some more specific details. Minister Isaac. Thank you, Parliamentary Secretary Lovely. It's um, a great day to be here. You know, every day I'm proud to be in a position to listen to Alberta women and help create new opportunities for them to succeed. From small business owners to academics, community leaders to professionals, women in this province are achieving incredible things. Over the past couple of years, we've all faced challenges and changes. Women in particular often bore the brunt of increased family care and instability in their workplaces. Although women across the province found the strength and resiliency to make it through, I know how tough it was at times. I want to thank every woman for helping their families, neighbours and colleagues stay afloat. Alberta's government is working to help women rebuild their careers and find new opportunities. Not only is this important for women and their families, it's also an important strategy to grow Alberta's economy. The Premier's Council on Charities and Civil Society spent months listening to women, Indigenous communities and civil society organizations to learn more about the challenges women have faced because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Hearing about the concerns women have had related to caregiving, domestic violence, employment and mental health and addictions demonstrates the depths of these issues. Rather than just quoting statistics about rising cases of sexual assault or the changes in women's employment rates, we have real stories from real women to show the importance of taking action now. During my time as Associate Minister of Status of Women, I've focused my attention on ensuring women are given the support they need to recover from the pandemic economically and socially. As part of Alberta's economic recovery plan, we've launched several new initiatives and investments to support women. We successfully negotiated a Made in Alberta plan to reduce licensed daycare fees by an average of 50% for families. We've invested more dollars into the Women in STEM scholarship so that we could support a record number of students this year. And just recently, we launched the Women's Economic Recovery Challenge Grant and announced those results the other day to fund projects that will create new career and training opportunities for women. You know, I'm proud of what we've achieved so far. For the most part, female employment in Alberta has returned to the level it was before the pandemic. Although this is great news, I want to make sure women don't just recover, but thrive. The goal is to build a province where all women can reach their full potential, build fulfilling, well-paying careers, and live safe, happy lives. Investment in women now is a smart strategy in our mission to build a strong, resilient Alberta. Thank you to all of the members of the Premier's Council on Charities and Civil Society. All of your hard work has really made a difference and this report is actually in incredible in its depth and its reach. These recommendations will help ensure we are focusing our efforts on the most important issues for women in this province. I look forward to not only reviewing the report and developing an implementation, implementation plan with my colleagues in government and partners in civil society. Now I'll pass this on to Minister Sawney, who was a key, not only supporter, but I'm going to say uh, the leading genesis of this council. And uh, please, Minister Sawney.
Thank you, Minister Isaac. It is such a pleasure to be here today. I'm so thrilled this report and this work around women's economic recovery has been a bit of a labor of love for me. So the fact that I'm standing here today talking about the announcement of this report and the results is very meaningful to me personally. In many ways, this report builds on the work of other key reports published in recent years on the impact of COVID-19 on women's participation in the workforce. Reports like the 2020 Women in the Workplace by McKinsey and Company and the Feminist Economic Recovery Plan for Canada by the YWCA and Partners and more. This report is an Alberta-specific publication that affirms many of the findings of previous publications and outlines a series of recommendations to ensure that the government of Alberta and civil society continue to work in lockstep together. There is no doubt that women and gender diverse persons were disproportionately affected by COVID-19. They were hardest hit by job losses due to changes in the workplace and the added pressures of parenting and caregiving in a stay-at-home environment. And for those living in multi-generational households, this also included caregiving for elders in their family. Suddenly, overnight, the already challenging and pre-existing double shift became a triple shift and more. Frontline and essential workers were most impacted by the pandemic. But we also saw many senior level women in the pipeline for leadership positions begin to consider downshifting their careers or leaving the workforce altogether because of these challenges. This set back gains made in recent years that saw more women in senior leadership roles. Again, just to repeat that, this was a setback for women. The stress of job loss, coupled with the effects of the pandemic and isolation from, from family and friends, also led to a devastating increase in incidences of domestic violence. The data that has been collected over recent years clearly demonstrates this. This data is very troubling. We have also seen an increase in violence directed towards women from racialized communities. This is also deeply, deeply troubling. Together, these challenges and more related to mental health supports, barriers in access to capital for women-led businesses and entrepreneurs, and incomplete development of diversity and inclusion policies in the workplace. Together, these challenges presented many obstacles for women, limiting their participation in our communities and economy. That is why, when I was a Minister of Community and Social Services, I asked the Premier's Council on Charities and Civil Society to engage with leading organizations and experts on these issues last year. I also asked the Council to speak directly to women with lived experiences, to speak directly with women, to hear their stories and their experiences firsthand. It was critical to do this work. I know how dedicated all the members of the council were to listening to the voices that needed to be heard. And for that, I'm profoundly grateful. I'm so grateful for their commitment. Months of discussions and research have been distilled into this report, which outlines thoughtful recommendations on how Alberta's government and civil society can work together. It is important to note that while this report is being announced today, much work has already been undertaken by the government of Alberta to address some of these recommendations. Minister Isaac has alluded to some of that work, but I will repeat it because it's, it's worth repeating again and again. Additional funding to address family and gender-based violence was provided through the Ministry of Community and Social Services through their traditional funding streams through COVID-specific streams and through civil society grant funding to ethnocultural communities and leading organizations to create capacity and data collection systems. Support has also been provided to organizations helping women reskill to enter STEM-related occupations. Recently, my colleagues, Minister Isaac and Minister Schweitzer announced additional funding for STEM scholarships and from the Ministry of Transportation, I announced $3 million of grant funding directly geared for a women's driving back to work grant. And very importantly, and of great impact to all working parents in Alberta, 
My colleague, the Minister of Children's Services, Rebecca Schultz, recently signed the child care deal with the federal government, ensuring more child care supports for families across our province. We know that there is more work to do, and that is why this report is particularly important, as it highlights additional gaps that need to be addressed, both by government and by civil society. This work will be ongoing and will reflect the changing dynamics in our province as we consider post-pandemic recovery and healing. Finally, I would like to say that I'm honored to have been a part of this work and will continue to work to further the goals of enhanced participation of women in the workforce. I firmly believe strong women create strong communities. This report will guide our actions. In order to grow our economy and build for the future, we must not leave women behind. And that means getting more women participating meaningfully and safely in our communities and every sector of our economy. Thank you to Dr. Christie for your leadership on the council. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank my former Deputy Minister, Cynthia Farmer, and her team of ADMs and beyond, who supported my vision in supporting women's economic recovery and brought many aspects of it to fruition, including this report. Thank you as well, heartfelt thank you to all of the members of the Premier's Council who are community builders, nonprofit leaders, and business owners who understand the importance of giving back. I appreciate you sharing your experience and wisdom with us. And also, a very, very big thank you to Minister Luan for all of his work in community and social services and taking this work forward. I would now like to invite Minister Luan to come up and share a few words. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister Sani. Uh, as you can see, uh, her love to this piece of work uh, naturally fits so strongly to her compassion. Uh, I'm also pleased to stand here with uh, uh, two other, um, I call fellow um, MLA and cabinet uh, colleagues, uh, Minister Azek and uh, MLA Lovely. Uh, they are the prime examples of women leader in our government, women leader in our community. I feel so humble. I'm working side by side with all of them, advancing today's important cause here. Um, not to forget, uh, I have my parliamentary assistant, uh, MLA Jeremy Nixon, um, who is a male, but equally compassionate to support this cause. And uh, Dr. Joe Christie, I know way back uh, before politics that uh, worked in the sort of service field. He also shared deeply about his uh, compassion in this cause. Uh, thank you, Dr. Christie, for your leadership uh, as a chairman for the Premier's Council on Charity and, and uh, uh, Civil Societies. Uh, today's uh, report is a big reflection to a collective uh, wisdom and efforts by many of us here today. I am so humbled to join you all, uh, share the moment here. Uh, as the uh, incoming um, uh, Minister of Community Social Service. I know I have big shoes to fill after <laughs> Minister Sani, but I'm so excited to see the work of this council and this report uh, come to fruition. As Alberta bounces back from uh, uh, the difficult couple of years of uh, battling COVID-19 and its effect on our economy, uh, we know how crucial it is for everyone to be included in the economic recovery. This is why Alberta government is taking big steps to address employment by investing heavily in supports and services for Albertans who want to work. And you'll hear me talking about this in the coming months, along with the uh, Minister of uh, um, Jobs Economy and, and uh, Minister of Advanced Education. We have big plans uh, for Albertans here. Um, during COVID, as many of you learned that uh, it hit the hardest uh, during, for the economic downturn, and often people who are already underrepresented uh, uh, in the workforce uh, suffered even further there. This report uh, by the Premier's Council of Charity and Civil Society on supporting women's uh, economic recovery will help guide Alberta government as it works to create new jobs and career opportunities for women. Working with uh, community partners, 
uh, we will identify economic recovery measures to facilitate women's return to the labor market. In fact, we have already addressed uh, many of those uh, recommendations as uh, both ministers alluded early, but I love that sentence. For the great work we've done, uh, we can never be shy of repeating the key messages here. I'll go on to repeat the come up, uh, highlight some of those too. Introducing financial support for women entering STEM uh, careers, negotiating a plan to reduce lessons the daycare fees by 50% and providing funding to nonprofit uh, organizations uh, increase women's participation in the economy. In fact, on this last item, um, a couple of days ago, I announced uh, 7 million additional support uh, for 37 projects through the Civil Society Grant. Uh, with this, I can tell you a significant amount of money was dedicated for women uh, to uh, combating uh, what we call social recovery but also increase their economic participation. So I'm very proud we're taking actions on that. It is through the cooperation and the participation of our civil society partners will fuel um, social recovery and increase economic particip participation for more our burdens. I'd like to thank our civil society partners for their support on, their import on the, such important issues. And uh, thank you to Premier's Council on charity and civil society for their recommendations to help us move forward uh, with actions to improve the opportunities for women in our province. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to come to share uh, with uh, my support to this important cause. Now I'd like to pat, uh, pass the podium to my parliamentary assistant, MMA Jeremy Nixon. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Minister, and uh, thank you for your your comments uh, as, uh, as a man. Um, I believe that I have an important role as well in, in regards to providing leadership and changing uh, entrenched cultural norms. And, uh, you know, even, even kind of going back to the start of the pandemic, uh, my wife uh, stepped up and she went to work with uh, the homeless in our city and, and vulnerable communities. And, uh, you know, it was important as a man that I was there to help encourage and support and be there. And, uh, and my role within our family. And uh, we have such an important role as men in our communities to stand up and show leadership in this area. So thank you for that. And thank you for your leadership on this file. Thank you, uh, Minister Isaac, Minister Sani, Parliamentary Secretary Lovely, uh, for all of your leadership as well in our province. And the example that you set uh, of women in leadership uh, for my kids and for all uh, kids. Thank you for, for your efforts. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, the Premier reached out to me and uh, he asked me, uh, well, he reached out because he was concerned and uh, about um, the impact that this pandemic was going to have on, on our community, uh, understanding that it would cause stress in families, it would create need where there wasn't before, it would exasperate need that was already there. And uh, he asked, how do we help encourage volunteerism and civil society action to be able to address that need? My advice at that time was that the government should not take over but government should work towards strengthening what's already taking place. And that was the good news because there was so much already happening in our community and it didn't take much to look around and see that. And in my own community, I saw the Calgary Seniors Resource Society stepping up to help uh, connect with seniors that were living in isolation, to help distribute food and medication. I saw the Youth Empowerment Society uh, step up to collect laptops and technology to help that get that to kids that were uh, without technology and now needing to learn and study from home. Uh, Compassion Ministries in my community through Centre Street Church distributed 100,000 food hampers throughout the pandemic. I saw community associations actively looking towards meeting or, or finding need in their community and working towards meeting that need. I even heard from one of my uh, constituents uh, about how she cooked uh, a hot meal every day and delivered it to a senior that was living in isolation next door. And uh, so it was good news because civil society was already doing what they do best. And, uh, but of course, there was also many civil society partners that struggled throughout the pandemic and uh, that's why I think the formation of this council, although it was, it was set to happen uh, uh, prior, but it, the fact that it took place at the start of this pandemic, I think was timely because their advice 
in, in helping getting through the pandemic and meeting need throughout the pandemic has been invaluable to this government. And so I'm so very thankful uh, for the council and their work. Um, but their advice is also gonna be absolutely critical as we move forward for recovery and making sure that recovery means uh, is gonna be there for everyone, that they, we can all recover together. Part of politics, many of you know I worked with uh, many volunteer organizations, uh, including the, the Mustard Seed, and I've seen firsthand that lives can be changed when neighbors rise up together to tackle challenges that so many in our community are faced. And so I wanna personally thank uh, our Premier, Premier Jason Kenney, for his vision in putting this council together and uh, for listening to our many great not-for-profit and civil society partners. Government's role, again, is not to take over that of community, but it does have a very important role. And I believe this report uh, outlines a number of recommendations that government can take uh, to make sure that we can aid in the efforts that our civil society partners are taking in our communities to address issues like women's economic recovery. The pandemic reminded us of the important role that we all have as a community in helping our neighbors. And I'm thrilled to be part of a government caucus that is looking for innovative ways to partner with civil society. So thank you again to the, uh, the ministers, to the premier, uh, but I especially wanna thank the council, uh, starting with the leadership of Joel Christie, uh, the, the council chair, being able to work with this council over the last couple of years and hear their passion and their heart and their ideas and what they've invested, not only in this report, uh, but in, in Alberta and in Albertans. Uh, I'm very, very thankful uh, for them and, and what they've done and especially thankful for the board chair. And so with that, I'd like to be able to invite Joel Christie, the board chair, up to give some comments. Thank you, um, Jeremy. And uh, I wanna thank Associate Minister Isaac for the invitation to be here uh, and for your commitment to a strong economic, economic future for, the, for women. I also wanna thank Minister Rajan Sani, who in her former role first asked the council to provide advice on these issues. You heard her passion and it's reflected in Jason Luan as well and on Minister Isaac. This passion is growing because it's coming from the heart. I also wanna thank uh, Premier Kenny, for supporting the Council's ongoing role. The Premier's Council on Charities and Civil Society was established in 2020 to provide advice to government on how to civil society, which includes local community-based organizations, networks, and businesses. Businesses played a big part in civil society here in Alberta. It, um, they worked on how they could em empower how they can be empowered to help address pressing social issues. I want to emphasize the role business played. It wasn't played, um, uh, wasn't really advertised in the paper covered by the media, but there were some fantastic, as, as uh, Parliamentary Secretary Jeremy uh, Nixon mentioned, I know ATCO opened up their kitchen to Calgary, uh, Calgary Seniors Resource Society. Volunteers came in to make lunches for seniors who couldn't, couldn't move move out. Uh, many, many roles. Uh, I know another organization that uh, took time, they realized that uh, the tables weren't big enough in extended care settings and they bought tables and brought them in so seniors could sit six feet apart while they're having their meals. Lots of things happened that uh, happened behind the scenes and these are all part of civil society in Alberta. It shows their active citizenship and their good corporate citizenship. The COVID-19 pandemic has created part hardships for all Albertans, but has had unique and disproportionate impact on women, often worsening long-standing challenges. Some of the key impacts of the challenges uh, included the increased burden of caregiving and, and domestic roles, an increased risk of family, domestic and sexual violence, negative impacts on women's jobs and their career tracks, heightened issues related to mental health and addictions. And the council's job was to explore how civil society did and can help address these challenges and ensure an increasing recovery. 
To inform the advice, our advice, the Council had conversations with over a dozen organizations directly involved in supporting women, and we also received reports and input from 60 more organizations. We held focus groups for women receiving services and participated in two conversations with Indigenous elders. Now, I want to bring your attention. In the report on around page 11, there is a link to the elders' report. They asked us to respect their oral history, and so we created an oral report that, um, where they summarize the impact this pandemic had on Indigenous women in particular. So I invite you to look at that uh, link and listen to that uh, video. The Council also reviewed key research related to these issues, and we learned a lot from this process. Not surprisingly, we learned the experience, that women vary, experience of women varied according to their circumstances. The report reinforces that addressing these complex and often interrelated challenges requires a partnership between government and civil society. We provide advice on what this partnership could look like in six broad areas, caregiving, safety, wellness, and, and health, employment and, and entrepreneurship, diversity and inclusion, dignity, uh, digital equity, planning and alignment, and these top priorities are outlined in our report. The report has two columns. It says here's, what, here's an issue, here's what civil society has and can do, and is appropriate to do, and here's how government can support them. I advise, ask you to ta really take a look at that. Solving these complex challenges is never simple or easy. Despite this, the Council is pleased the government has already taken these steps, and we've mentioned them already. And I commend the government, led by Associate Minister Isaac, on its commitment to further collaborative uh, efforts. When thinking about this collaboration, I. I go back to a speech the Premier gave at Cardis Institute in 2018 when he articulated his vision for civil society. He noted the first question often asked about social challenges is, what should government do? Instead, he suggests the question should be, what is the best way for civil society to flourish? Then we can ask how government can help that to occur. Our report reinforces that vision by focusing in on what we want to achieve and then identifying opportunities for civil society and government to work together on lasting change. Our report doesn't provide all the answers, but it contributes to further dialogue and a stronger partnership as we go forward. So in closing, I want to thank the elected officials here today for the invitation to be here and for their commitment to this work. And it is heartfelt commitment. I also want to thank the other 14 members of the council. Their commitment and expertise is remarkable. These truly, this really is a council of, of wisdom. Finally, I want to thank civil society. The agency, business leaders, the women who with lived experience, and the Indigenous elders who so generously gave their time and, and expertise and wisdom to the Council as we developed this report. Thank you. And I now return this to Minister Isaac, or oh, oh, Minister, Parliamentary Secretary Jackie Lovely, who is also a member of our Council. Thank you, Dr. Crystal. Well, thank you everyone for your dedication in making life better for women in this province. This report will help government of Alberta and civil society focus on the challenges women are facing right now. This feedback is invaluable and will help grow strong communities and a strong Alberta. Thank you again for joining us today. And I'll now pass it over to Amanda LeBlanc who will coordinate questions from the media. Thank you, so we've, um, there's no questions from the floor so we'll just move straight into the phone lines. Alberta today. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I think it's for uh, the Associate Minister, Isaac. Um, what's the timeline you're, you have for um, getting that action plan in place?
Thanks so much for the question, and it's an important question. Um, timing does matter. I will point out that already our department has gone through to identify um, all of the actions that have been taken so far on the existing recommendations. And I'd also like to point out, as Minister Sani did, that many um, other reports that are now coming forward, such as the Human Trafficking Task Force, MMIWG Joint Working Group uh, report has just been received by the Minister, and other reports, a lot of the um, recommendations actually dovetail. And as we've gone through and done an assessment, it's quite remarkable, actually, how much work has already been started and, uh, and is in progress. We will continue to work on this. Um, Parliamentary Secretary Nixon is actually tasked with looking at the pieces around uh, funding of civil society, uh, really talking about how that is done and looking at the sort of overarching structure of that in government because we know from experience, particularly during the pandemic, but all, all along, and, and the council rightly identified this, that how we fund civil society really does make a difference in terms of their ability to continue work often, to, to work uh, without breaks. So we're gonna continue to work on that. Um, I imagine that we'll have some very constructive uh, pieces, uh, at least mostly complete uh, by the fall, um, but we're gonna continue to work on this uh, every single day and, um, and again, continue to work on the pieces that are in progress already. And Catherine, did you have a follow-up question? I do. Uh, so one of the recommendations around data involves gender-based analysis plus. That used to be just standard with every policy. There was a section in every budget, and it's gone now um, since 2019. Um, why, why has gender-based analysis plus not been a part of this government's work, and um, what are you going to be doing to bring it back? Um, actually, I would uh, I would actually say that it has been a part of our work all along, and it continues to be. I will note that uh, much of our work uh, in the associate minister's uh, office has been very much with a lens, obviously, towards women. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And when you see the um, the women's hub, which will be launched shortly, you will notice that uh, GBA is very much part of that. Um, certainly uh, taking a lens on everything that affects our lives is important. And so I see Mr. Lawan has some words about that as well. Uh, thank you, great question. I just want to support uh, uh, Minister Alice that uh, action has been taken uh, on a going basis. With the seven million uh, uh, civil society grant uh, I just mentioned earlier in my speech, uh, one project is specifically designated for this uh, uh, gender-based analysis. So uh, we're there, we're doing it as we speak. Um, I think the, the spirit of the council's uh, recommendation is so integrated into our day-to-day -day work, uh, reflected uh, uh, on the ongoing work. I believe uh, when I first got the first draft of this report, this is back in uh, December, um, the next day, uh, Minister Isaac and Minister of uh, Job Economy announced $1 million uh, investment for women in uh, economic recovery. So I, I was so excited. I called Dr. Joe Christie. I said, you wouldn't believe how fast this government moved on the recommendations. As we were talking about the report, uh, the actions are taking. So that's a, two examples I can give it to you. We, we mean it. Uh, we are committed for it. We're doing it as we uh, were uh, proceeding. Thank you, and I believe there is one more caller on the line to put through. Kayleen Skolsky, CTV. Hi, yes, thank you for taking my question. I believe it's for the Associate Minister as well. I just looking through this report, a lot of these recommendations put forward in regards to training, job flexibility, child and adult care, inclusivity, these are ideas that seem to have been put forward by social agency and policy researchers for years, perhaps decades. I guess what is new in this report that the government plans to act on? Well, I think um, this report has been really important in terms of how it has been, the genesis of it has been from the point of view of civil society. It's taking, uh, it's taking that lens and sort of shifting the focus. Um, and I think um, 
we've seen that it really does take more than just government action to uh, accomplish intended goals. But importantly, what it really, the real difference here is that rather than government stating, well, these are the goals from the top down, this is actually civil society and women telling the rest of society and government what the goals ought to be based on lived experience. And I think that's so incredibly important. And the fact that we have lived experience expressed not only from women, but um, also uh, Indigenous elders from business, from community organizations, not-for-profits. And I'll point out as well that many not-for-profits, a lot of the not-for-profit sector is actually run by women. And so I think we have an important perspective here that, um, that has provided a lens for us in terms of how we go about this. And more will be coming in terms of action items. Um, certainly it will be done um, cooperatively as we work with uh, civil society and charities going forward. And is there a follow-up question? Yeah, I was just looking to clarify a few of the details in regards to the report, and I forgive me if I missed it in the news release or didn't see it. I'm just wondering how much, um, I guess, yeah, how much did the report cost and how long did it take to complete? I guess I could I could address that. Our total budget is fifty five thousand dollars for the year for the fourteen of us, and so we've been going. We started our consultations in um, uh, let me try to think late July, and uh, we finished our report by uh, uh, December, as uh, Minister uh, Luan mentioned. Perfect. Thank you. And are there any more callers to put through? Oh, and Minister Luan has something to add. Uh, just to clarify that further. So the $50,000 Dr. Joe Christie talking about is the annualized full budget for the council. But this work is only a piece of uh, additional assignment within that year's work. It's about four months' of work. Uh, so, it's, so I just want to make sure it's not that this report costs us $53,000, not at all. The council has ongoing work uh, advising the government for a broad range of uh, policies related to charity and civil societies. Uh, along the line of the, of the mandate uh, came with this uh, focus on women in economic recovery. I think Minister Isaac, uh, Minister Sonia at the time was a minister, uh, took it upon our government, uh, specifically named the focus of this project. Uh, within four months, it was delivered. So I, I have to say, as an incoming minister, I was very impressed by the efficiency and the work that has done uh, within such a, a short time. If I may give my own um, pers uh, perspective on how I see the report, it gives a comprehensive overall uh, view of all the issues related to women and uh, in academic recovery. It speaks from multiple um, perspectives, from uh, diversity, from economy, from childcare, from indigenous involvement, uh, many pieces of that, from policy and data analysis, and speaks of some of the gaps uh, within the sector, how we should shift away from uh, input into more reporting on outcomes and uh, perhaps even recommending multi-year funding as versus to one-time uh, project. So uh, I'd say it gives you a comprehensive bird's view in a systemic uh, look how the issues are interrelated and how the government can move uh, integrated uh, moving forward on. So that's my take. Okay, and that's a wrap. Thank you so much, everyone.